Well, hello there, you two. How are you doing? Doing great. It's good. This is a lovely, friendly audience, and they are absolutely here to listen to some fantastic stuff about human AI, symbiotic interaction. I mean, this is the stuff of science fiction when we even talk about these things. But actually, I think what we're going to do is start by asking both of you what you're most excited about. And I'll start with you, Maya. I don't know. Uh, probably I would hate to die because uh, I will not know what will come next with the tech. So I'm most excited about the tech and what will come next. <laughs> and one of the parts of this is definitely deep learning. I believe this is super cool. OK, so deep learning and not dying. Brilliant. That's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rana, what about you? What are you most excited about? I am most excited in building about building emotional intelligence into our machines and all the different applications it will unlock, especially around mental health. OK, brilliant. Well, I think what we'll start with is you with a question about why having a, a human-like avatar is so important. Surely something simple with a representation is enough. Tell us, tell us why we need more. I think that humans have this bias to see human faces and human-like characteristic in any shape. Mm -hmm. So even if your avatar will be a chair, you would still like that it has a mouth and can talk and has eyes and can look at you. I believe that uh, it's easier for us to talk and communicate with uh, other humans and other human-like characters. Mm. So it is extremely important uh, to have actually this kind of comfortable space um, in which we can express ourselves and ask questions and get our goals done and achieved. And can you go into a little bit of the things that you're adding to these avatars? Because I'm imagining when you're talking to something and it, it blinks or it's, it's moving its mouth to match the sounds, are there more interactions that you're building in? So the interactions that we are building into the avatars are all kind of um, behaviors that are important. Things like report. So like when we look at each other, we are acknowledging each other. So you want that to have from the avatar as well. Uh, politeness, um, kindness, uh, giving support, but also having certain kind of personality that's interesting because otherwise if we have only these four, that would be pretty boring very soon. So other kinds of personalities are very interesting and this is like one of the projects that we are currently working on in Meta to give avatars specific personality. And I would imagine that culturally there will be different aspects mm. of how we interact. In some places, eye contact is considered quite confrontational, say, or other kind of movements that could be construed meaning one thing than another. If you nod in some countries, it means no. So <laughs> can you talk a little bit? Um, maybe I can bring you on this if, you're, if you'd like to talk about this idea of emotion inside the technology, I guess. Yeah. I mean, what is fascinating about this field is we forget that the majority of the way humans communicate is nonverbal. And it's kind of split equally between your facial expressions, your body posture, your hand gestures, your vocal intonations. And so these are really important channels for communication. It's how we build trust. It's how we build empathy. Um, and so as AI becomes more and more ingrained in our lives, um, we need to bring this kind of sensing technology so that we can incorporate our nonverbal communication. You know, when, you're, when you chat with ChatGPT, you're just using text. It's completely blind to your emotional state. Mm. Um, so a lot of the work that the two of us are doing is trying to change that. Okay. And this on cultural diversity, this is extremely important point. So, but it's a very difficult point also to achieve with the tech because you need to change the kind of interaction you will have based on the geolocation of the user mm. and how you will get to this information, what is appropriate. So really personalization is uh, the way forward here. In terms of personalization is not only making your avatar how you want it, but also that that avatar understands uh, if you are having a partner or a friend in that avatar, that it understands from which culture you are coming and what is like accepted by you or, or normal for mm. you. So it's just occurred to me, this idea of, and you're going to know about this, what the user wants versus what they actually should be given. In terms of this, we're in a really interesting area because the interaction between somebody and an avatar could be a completely private one or it could be one that's, that's public. How would, 
what's the responsibility of the tech company almost to, in terms of how you would feed the, the sentiment of the avatar? Does that make sense? Like how, how, much does, how much does the company or the organization, what role do they have in serving something that's either palatable to the user yeah. or more true to what the information is? So I really think that at this point, we are just at the edge of this research. Yeah. So we have actually no idea. Cool. So, and I think that things will become clear in the coming years as the avatars become a way of interacting with AI. What Rana said is extremely important. Currently, all large language models are just textual. Yep. And I believe that uh, this is not the only face of AI we should see. So really giving this AI a face in terms of avatars and behaviors will be really, really interesting. But what is the best way of doing that is just we have, you know, no idea really. So we are bringing something to the market. I think everybody knows now about it. Mark talked about it and there are even like Financial Times uh, talked about it. Those are these AI chat personas and they will have this kind of faces and personalities and let's see what people say, you know, mm. maybe some will be interesting and some will not. So we'll learn, I guess. Yeah. I think there are really powerful applications of this, of these types of avatars. So this is a study that was done by the University of Southern California a number of years ago where they had PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder patients come in. Half of the patients saw an emotionally intelligent avatar and the other half saw a human therapist. Mm. Right. And what they found was the, pat the patients that saw the digital avatar were way more forthcoming with, they were much more open about sharing their experiences and the sessions were longer. And I thought that was really interesting because it, it potentially means, I mean, they asked the patients and basically the patients said, well, humans are very judgmental. Mm. We didn't want to, we didn't feel safe, right? So it opens up this question of these kinds of chatbots and avatars. They can be confidants, they can be mental health coaches and therapists, maybe life coaches, mm. right? Much more affordable, much more patient. They're there for you all the time. Um, learning companions, right? Like the, the, the applications are numerous. And um, so that, that's, that's kind of exciting, but it's a double-edged sword too we, we need exactly. to think about. Yeah, I, I'd actually like to ask you more about sort of the emotional applications of AI because I think that there's this almost strangeness when we talk about machines and feelings yep. and what, what we're trying to do is simulate an emotional response or are we trying to program a machine to, to do it on the fly? Does that make sense? Yeah, but a lot of the work I'm focused on is trying to get machines to understand our, our emotional states. Um, there's a whole class of work that's about giving machines feelings and emotions. Um, I, I don't do that work, but certainly it's interesting and important too. Um, so some of the applications, right? Like today in mental health, the gold standard is still a survey. Like literally you ask people on a scale from one to 10, how depressed are you? <laughs> very, very subjective data. Um, Whereas we could use our computers, our phones, I think we did a study where people check their phones 15 times an hour. Like we just check our phones all the time. That's an opportunity to do an emotional checkpoint with the person. And if you know the baseline of the person, if they start deviating based on their facial expressions or vocal biomarkers, you can kind of tie that to mental health disease and get them just in time help. Because mm. we don't have enough mental health workers and therapists to address the mental health crisis and loneliness pandemic we, um, we have right now. So that's one application. One of the things that I would just like to add to what Rana say is that it is absolutely impossible to understand emotions from mm -hmm. human faces or human voices. So what anybody of us feel remains in us. Mm -hmm. What we can recognize in, by this tech that uh, we are developing is apparent emotional expressions. So that means what you apparently want to tell this computer will say, ah, okay, okay, that's what this person is currently showing to me. But that doesn't mean that it can understand ever your deep feelings. So this is extremely important to understand. Okay. And secondly, building AI with emotions, okay, I'm judgmental, obviously, I'm a human, mm -hmm. it's impossible. So uh, they can, again, show to you 
signals and signs of empathy, but it never will mean that they right. really have empathy for human beings or any other um, sense, sentient life or for another AI. This does not exist. We can only put apparent uh, expressions on this AI to actually fool us uh, so that we feel more comfortable in talking with them. So this is extremely important to understand. In fact, those of you who are interested in this body, like what we're showing and what we're doing, there's a great book called What Everybody is Saying by a guy called Joe Navarro, who was an FBI kind of oh. profiler. Uh, you've probably read it. If not, then I don't know that it's book. brilliant. Yeah, it's, don't read it. read it on an aircraft, though, because then you go through customs afterwards and you're really tense yeah. because you're not sure what sort of signals that you're giving off. And that sort of brings me to this idea of if you know that you're being read by a machine, then does that not kind of skew the results? It's a bit like if you go and ask a bank manager for a loan, and you, depending on how much you need it, you're probably giving off different signs. And, and where do we start working with the ethics of how much we can play with the data? So first of all, opt-in and consent is super important. I think that needs to be like one of the core values or one of the requirements. Um, we have amassed over the last 12 or so years um, over 15 million face videos of people basically sharing their emotional experience. Could be while watching content or driving a car. Um, and we tell people, right? We're telling people we're turning the camera on, <laughs> and it's crazy what people do. I think the first maybe three seconds, um, you know, the person's aware that the camera's there, and then they totally forget about it. And it's uh, we've seen that with driving. People are texting while driving, and they're falling asleep at the wheel, and they're drinking while driving. Yeah, it's insane, even though, again, they're the ones who put the camera in, and they know that it's there. So, um, yeah. It's like in reality TV shows. I think right. people do start to almost forget that they've given the consent, exactly. almost, or perhaps they just become back to not Normal. being... Right. Surveilled? I don't know. I mean, uh, I've got another book recommendation called Watching the English by <laughs> Kate Fox. It's about the different cultural um, responses to emotions and Ooh. tonality and words and how oh, we sort of... It's, it's like in the UK, when somebody says, oh, yeah, it's hot, isn't it? Then you say yes. You don't say, oh, you call that hot? Well, in Texas, it's not hot at all. <laughs> so this idea of reciprocal greetings and, and this sort of cultural aspects of how we interact and how it's going to translate to machines. I, I think what I'd probably like to talk about is this idea of digital twin, the future of AI, the personal AIs, where we're going. You touched a little bit on this, this idea of where you think the future is going with deep learning, but Maya, tell us more. Um, so what I think is that uh, we will uh, have our avatars in the future and we will I mean, currently, I think uh, that's the only, or one of, I think the only industry that grows so fast, uh, uh, and that is the computer games. Mm. So um, this is something that it is um, definitely uh, a way of the future. However, you mentioned something while we were in the back room, like will this avatar be able to make decisions on buying something or not buying something without me? <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is just a, um, your digital representation. So uh, you are the driver behind this avatar. That's how the avatars are developed. It is not that you build this avatar and let it go on its own. No. Well, I'd love that, though. <laughs> yeah. I would love something to just do. Like, you know what, LJ, you've been eating quite unhealthily. I've ordered you a nice, you know, a decent basket of food online. And by the way, here's some clothing that we think I think you'd like. One of the things so what you are actually saying is probably a friend. So <laughs> yes, you may have a friend, an avatar who is your friend or your advisor. You can definitely have that, but your own avatar will be always driven by you. Right. I actually, there's a company called Our One, uh -huh. and I've given them, they use this input, like a short video footage of, of a person. So I've given them my video, and they've created an AI Rana. And now I'm toying with the idea, like, maybe I should send AI Rana on conferences on, on my behalf. And, and they have a business model where the, the avatar, like, literally charges, you know, charges per hour or, you know, 
Um, and I think that's fascinating. I can have AI Rana do all the hard work, and I can just go to the Caribbean and chill by the beach. You know, I have interviewed people <laughs> over Zoom before and wondered if, like, I've interviewed people over Zoom before and wondered if they actually are AI generated. Oh, oh, so no. it's, okay, it's, that's that. it's coming. But I mean, this is the whole idea of physicality yeah. and our need to have these rich forms of communication. It mm. kind of goes back to what you're saying, making these avatars feel real. I, I mean, we talked briefly about VR backstage, and I was producing music in the metaverse in a low latency environment where I was a purpley avatar astronaut thing and I could I could sort of discern some movement and interaction with the other music producers but without their expressions it would have felt very hollow but there was um, it was there was a sense of interaction from the audio but I could see how that richness of communication be it on a screen or in VR so would add simulated sincerity? I don't know. Like, what do you think? I don't know. Um, really, I think that this, what Rana was saying, I must come back to that because I got stuck in that local <laughs> meeting before she said something. You don't, like, you don't like my AI doing all the work and me? And, and, and no, I think it's uh, super crazy and interesting, <laughs> but super crazy and, and, and dangerous in the sense like, um, the avatar will need to know everything you know mm -hmm. and have your personality. And I think, you know, this opens up so many problems of impersonification, mm -hmm. right. which um, I think we should not allow, really. So I, I am actually for having uh, AI audits uh, mm -hmm. of yeah. what the AI should do and how it should do. Um, and this would be definitely something on my list to not allow. <laughs> <laughs> Maya. I mean, that's the thing, though. Guardrails are going to be different for different people. Yeah. Rana's clearly okay Great. with having someone else do the work for her while she chills on the Caribbean, but there, there might be someone else that it, grabs it, it a Rana. It, and, yeah. it does bring up an important question, like how autonomous should my digital twin be? Yep. Is, is, it, is it like, does it have to come back to me for you know, with questions and answers, or, uh, or is it just unhinged out there doing its own mm. thing? And I, I think we don't know the answer to mm, that question, no. right? Especially if it's training itself still and has a yeah, bad interaction exactly. or something weird. I'm aware of the time. We've got a couple of minutes left. And we spoke backstage about how you learn and improve. Um, how do you get more knowledge and, and how do you pull in more data. And I know we've, we've talked on stage before, um, there's a previous guest who said that they have a team that they speak to. But quite fascinated, you were saying your son learned a ton of things on TikTok. Yeah. My or deep learning and AI. Oh my God, yeah, my son's 14. And literally, he is on the early users of all these AI tools and technologies, and his source is TikTok. It's yeah. fascinating. It's I guess that whole interesting. critical thinking alongside being able to search properly for things is, is part of it. But and also being this like risk taker, right? Like he'll try all the tech. I mean, I don't know how I feel about that as a parent, but he'll try all the technologies. We talk about them. He was one of the first users of ChatGPT and he ran into AI hallucinations and it was an amazing conversation we had together. I was like, okay, well, this is how an LLM works. Mm -hmm. Hence, this is why it's generative and it's hallucinating. And he was like, oh, I get it. So. Um, LinkedIn Learning is also a great a great resource. Andrew Ng has a lot of like really you know short videos that are, explain these concepts in a very accessible way. Coursera, we said MIT edX is great. Um, Oh, yes. I mean, there's a ton of resources. And I think yeah. it's almost, it's lovely to know that even with the amount of success and status that you have, that being open to learning appears to be quite a theme in the, in the realm of AI. And I'm, I'm really quite gutted that we don't have any time left to chat because this has been really fun. And uh, our, your panelists, uh, you guys have been amazing. And so thank you to Maya and Rana, everybody. That was thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.